Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, Democracy Now! host Amy Goodman on the importance of independent media and a revolutionary Latina women's bicycle crew. Welcome to the Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a backseat to those who are doing it. The world economy is hurtling from one centered on industry and the production of stuff to one centered on knowledge and the exchange of services and ideas. Will that future economy be a caring or a cruel one? If ideas are at the heart, nothing is more important than the men and women who control the spread of ideas. The old media was driven by and for profits. So what will the new one be driven by? More importantly, what will it stand for? Amy Goodman is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now!, a national daily independent award-winning news program airing on over 1,400 public television and radio stations worldwide. She's co-authored six New York Times best-selling books, including Breaking the Sound Barrier and The Silenced Majority, Stories of Uprisings, Occupations, Resistance and Hope. Her latest book is Democracy Now!, 20 Years Covering the Movements Changing America. Amy, 20 years. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Laura. It is hard to believe. I mean, 20 years ago, this was not our plan. The plan was we were the only daily election show in public broadcasting in 1996, the day after the election. Um, you know, we would end the show and go on to another project. Um, but there was more demand for the show after the uh, election than been before. And I think that was because of the hunger for independent voices. And the fact that, I mean, when I got the call to do, be the host of the show, you were in I was Haiti, right? in Haiti. I was in a safe house covering people fearful that if they declared for office, they would be gunned down. If they went to vote, they would be gunned down. And yet most people voted in Haiti. In our country, I get this call and say, huh, most people don't vote. Why bother? But I didn't think it was apathy. And I was really challenged by this idea. People care in the United States if they know. That's the issue, if they know. That's right. And also, what were people doing in their communities? Why wasn't it getting covered? And so that's why we use the primary system as a way to go to the states and see what people were saying. And I think it was that hunger for authentic yeah. voices, not the know-nothing pundits. So a lot of people want to know not just about the origins of the program, but your origins. You didn't just spring fully made into the set of Democracy Now! What can you tell us about who gave you the idea that you could do this work. Who inspired you the way you inspire us? I mean, my family had a tremendous influence on me, my mother and my father. My dad was a local ophthalmologist, um, and he not only was a great visionary as an eye doctor, um, but he was chosen as the head of the task force to integrate our schools. We had a diverse community, but we had the railroad tracks. And how would we go to school together? black and white together. And I went with him to the auditoriums and cafeterias of our community. I was in fifth grade. He had death threats against him, a thousand screaming parents. But he just judicially navigated, um, judiciously navigated our community through a very difficult place. And my mom would taught women's history and literature at local community colleges. And, you know, it would be local cops and firefighters, truck drivers who would take it so that they could make more money, more credit, more money for their salaries. And so they would go through the course offerings and, oh, chick lit, like women's literature. Nothing could be easier. I'm going to take that class. Mm -hmm. So they'd come in to Dorothy Bach Goodman's class and she would introduce them to Toni Morrison and Virginia Woolf. And this is the beginning of the women's liberation movement, and they would be reading these books. Oh, that's why my wife is so angry at me. That's why my daughter won't talk to me anymore. And soon they'd be bringing their wives and daughters. By the end of the class of a semester, the room would be packed to the rafters with whole families. Mm -hmm. And then she decided to go into family therapy. Um, she was a very resilient woman. But my parents were great role models for me and my brothers. And, you know, my extracurricular activity at school, junior high school, high school, was the newspaper. And I saw, as my brothers did, how, you know, you write an editorial and suddenly the principal has to answer your demands. And then we took it to a bigger stage after that. You know, in high school it's the principal and now it's the president. We should say that the book is co-authored by one of your brothers, David Goodman, and also Dennis Moynihan, of course. Um, introducing people to each other is kind of what we do. I think, in the media at our best. 
but there needs to be a door open to get into an institution that supports you and helps you grow in, in this business. For you and me, I think, it was WBAI. It's not been easy keeping that publicly owned community station alive. And it's part of a network that's seen its share of troubles. Can you talk about that? Why do you think it's been so hard? I mean, it is so important, Pacifica's roots, uh, going back to World War II and the first Pacifica station, KPFA in Berkeley, founded by a war resistor who came out of the detention camps named Lou Hill, who said there's got to be a media outlet not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born, KPFA, the first station in 49 in Berkeley, KPFK in 59 in Los Angeles, our station, New York, WBAI in 1960, 1970 KPFT in Houston, and 1977 WPFW in Washington. That's the Fab Five. That's the Pacifica Radio Network. And a lot of people talk about crowdsourcing today as if it's a new thing, but that's how they were funded. Oh, I mean, that's amazing, right? I mean, you didn't, couldn't have had a more difficult beginning. KPFA, they, first of all, they're on the air on FM. It's in its infancy. So you had to have a special radio. <laughs> it was called the subscriber. And finally you get this and you tune in and someone's asking you for money. I mean, that is not a way to begin. And yet they did, that's and right. it grew. The KPFT in Houston in 1970, in the spring it goes on the air, and within a few weeks it's blown off the air by the Ku Klux Klan. Literally. Right. You write they about it in the book. blow it up right in the middle of Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant, which I thought was a good song. And um, they finally go back on the air after a few weeks. They rebuild the transmitter, and the Klan straps 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blows it up again. After many months, they get back on the air in January of 71. And at this point, it becomes a national story. PBS in its infancy comes in to cover it. Arlo Guthrie comes back to Houston to finish his song, Alice's Restaurant, on the radio. And they go back on the air. And, you know, it was the Klan. It was the Klan, the Grand Dragon, the Exalted mm -hmm. Cyclops, I can't remember who. But there was a reason um, why they targeted it, because of the independent voices. Right. When you hear someone speaking for themselves, a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, an Afghan aunt, an Iraqi uncle, it immediately challenges the stereotypes and the caricatures that fuel the hate groups. I'm not saying you'll agree with what you hear, how often do we agree with our family members, but you begin to understand where someone is coming from. You don't want to destroy them. Yeah. That understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it is wielded as a weapon of war. And that's why we have to take the media back. We've talked a lot about form so far, but what about content? Um, you have to balance breaking news and responding to that in a different way from the way the other people do with a knowledge that the changes that are required are systemic and need a deep answer, not a quick one. How, how do you decide to, what to put on the air? Well, we made a decision early on we wanted to do a daily show to be part of the national conversation, and things right. do switch so quickly every single day. But there are trends, and it's not only bringing out the voices of um, you know, grassroots activists on the ground, but then also looking at, you know, the movements and how they're growing. And that's the big story that even in this election year where we see the power of movements, I mean, Bernie Sanders did not create that's right. this tidal wave he is riding. Although if you watch the money media, you would certainly get that idea. Right, because they, the movements don't hit the corporate media radar screen. I don't think they know how to cover them for a long time, right? Only when they have a leader. And they, they tried to ice out Bernie Sanders himself, but then it became absolutely ludicrous. I mean, as late as Super Tuesday 3, which was March 15th, that was the day of five primaries. You had Florida, Ohio, uh, Missouri, Illinois, and North Carolina. You had the day that Marco Rubio pulled out because he lost Florida, remember, mm. Senator Rubio. You had the day that that was the same day as Ohio, Senator John Kasich won his first primary. Ultimately, he would pull out. Illinois and Missouri, Sanders and Clinton were neck and neck. Um, and they played every speech of every candidate in right. full, as they should have, right? They had um, Trump and Rubio, Cruz, Kasich, and Clinton. Oh, wait, uh, Bernie <laughs> Sanders? Here, they were neck and neck. And was, did Bernie Sanders right. fall asleep? Right. Did he take the evening off? 
He was giving the biggest speech that night in Phoenix, Arizona, before thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. They didn't even speculate, where is Bernie tonight? Right. So we decided that night, the next day on Democracy Now!, we're going to play an excerpt of a speech. Who would have thought it was a revolutionary act to play the speech of a major party candidate on a major primary night? And that is still covering the speech of the, the leader and, and the, personal, the personal driver of the story, not the movements that fed into his campaign and what's brought him this far, right? Right. He didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, this is 2016. Look at 2011 just for a moment. Of course, we could go further back than that, but Occupy. Yeah. Um, that is the movement that he is riding. And yes, the police eviscerated the Occupy encampments. And for the media, that was the end of the Occupy encampments because the physical manifestation of them wasn't there anymore. Once they covered that. But after that, uh, you know, movements work in all different ways. They surface, they get submerged, they surface again. And Occupy also became Black Lives Matter, the immigrants' rights movement, you know, all the issues, the fight for 15, all of the issues the equality raises. And as they're oh, morphing in all different ways, uh, you have a presidential candidate that gives voice to them. And so he has... Um, all of these movements that are really there, and he rode that wave. And it's very important, I think, when we look at movements and electoral politics to see what's going to happen now. I was talking to a, a great group of student journalists the other day and asking them about the nature of American democracy. Some of their views, let's just say, were fairly cynical, but who can blame them? What's your vision of how the media could give people a richer sense of their own potential to make change, to make a difference? When we cover war and peace, not to have media brought to us by the weapons manufacturers. I mean, how many times do you watch Sunday talk shows on the networks and they say, uh, we'll be back to discuss how quickly we should bomb Syria or Yemen um, uh, after this commercial from McDonnell Douglas Lockheed or Martin. from Lockheed Martin or from Boeing? I mean, to have a media that's not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers when we cover war, to have a media that's not brought to us by the oil, gas, and coal companies when we cover climate change, not brought to you by the insurance industry when we cover health care. It is so obvious and so important. Independent media is the oxygen of a democracy. And I think we're seeing this develop all over, people looking for something else. We asked our friends on Facebook um, for suggestions of questions for you, and they were all over the map, but they did fall into a few clear categories, mostly having to do with who do you pick to put on the show? A lot of questions about why don't you have more women of color? Why don't you have more discussion of disability, of Palestine, of sex work? And then a lot of people wondering how you look after yourself. What's your self-care regimen? Uh, do you have one? And, and how do you handle having so many people wanting you to be everything to all of them. We don't do enough of anything, I think. And uh, we always strive every day uh, to bring out the diverse voices on so many different issues. And every day we work. And this is, uh, you know, a, what did they call Pacifica at the beginning? A noble experiment. And that's what I see democracy now as. And we can do better every which way. And so we welcome people's suggestions. I mean, in every, when I, you know, when we're on the tour, everywhere we go, make suggestions, issues we should cover, people we should talk to, be specific, give their contact information. That's how we learn. That's how we bring out this great diversity of voices that we can do better on every day. We have, and the self-care? Ah, that's a very interesting question. You know, I was invited on the Bill Maher show a couple weeks ago, and who was there but uh, Arianna Huffington? And, you know, she's the sleep guru. That's right. And um, I wanted to challenge her to a duel, like, you know, on the merits of sleeplessness. Yes. But she wasn't having anything of it. And I really did say, in June or whenever in the summer, I'm going to take a long nap. But... Um, I don't know, there isn't time. <laughs> Amy Goodman, thanks so much for coming in and for your work on radio, on television, and all of your books. For all of you who don't know what you need to know about Democracy Now!, check out our website. We'll post some links. Thank you. 
The Avarian Psychos Bicycle Brigade is an unapologetic feminist, all women of color bicycle crew based in East LA. And it's the subject of a new documentary by the same name. Chayla de la X is the founder of the Ovarian Psychos, as well as being a poet, an MC, and a mom. And de Soch is another over leader and a street artist who's responsible for much of the look of the crew. And Johanna Sokolowski is co-producer and co-director of the film, along with her filmmaking partner, Kate Trumbull Laval. Did I get your names more or less right? Yeah. Okay, All right, good. All right, good. So let's start with, you know, Ovarian Psychos. What are they? Who are they? You came up with the idea. Go for it. Yeah, well, we're a bicycle collective, and um, we utilize the bicycle to address certain issues in our community and um, to connect the dots as well and um, to have a have a space and not so much to make the streets safe, but to make them even that much more dangerous for the rapist or for the potential pedophile or, you know what I'm saying, for a cop or, you know what I'm saying, for a gentrifier. Your movie opens with a wild kind of cross between, I don't know, Easy Rider and <laughs> Born in Flames. Um, women on bikes in the streets of East LA. How did you get wrapped up in this film project? Kate, my filmmaking partner, was actually working on a film called No Mas Bebes, and it's about the forced sterilization mm -hmm. of Mexican origin women yeah. in East Los Angeles. And they were looking for outreach partners, and somebody mentioned the Ovarian Psychos would make a good outreach partner. And she, we were looking for a film, and she called me, and there was a few articles online, and they had a great Facebook presence, and we were just completely mm. enamored with them and with their politics. And the opening that you're referencing is sort of something that we imagined from the very beginning. It's kind of like when you first hear about them, the way that you, the place that your imagination goes. Yeah. It's Let's play a trailer so people get a sense okay. of it and they'll understand immediately why you went for both this group and the scene. Take a look. Ovarian Cycles is a refuge for the runaway, for the throwaway. I understood that being an at-risk youth, now an adult, I'm still an at-risk adult. You know what I'm saying? Like, that doesn't go away, right? And so, where are the spaces for us? We're just that safe space for each other to bring comfort, to bring a sense of family. Well, that's just the trailer from the new film, Ovarian Psychos. We have two of the psychos with us in the studio and the filmmaker. Um, Andy, let's bring you into this, sub into this story. Uh, how did you get wrapped up with the Ovarian Psychos? Um, a, a couple of the girls that I knew at the time were very into cycling and one day we found out that there was a very cycle meeting happening and we felt so compelled to just be part of it because we wanted to start our own collective as well so we just decided to just you know come together and we came to the first lunar ride which is now called the lunar death ride <laughs> because we were all so excited you know there was just so much energy it was a full moon and um, tragically, Chella had a really bad accident. <laughs> she ended. I don't know. She's laughing. It was so <laughs> scary, dude. It was so scary. She ended up like cracking her skull and two point five inches. Yes, and we literally all came together and we saw her on the floor, literally with her eyes rolled back and yeah, it was great, bloody, bloody. It was just shocking super shocking and terrifying and a lot of the women didn't come back because oh i was gonna say it's one hell of a way to build community <laughs> yeah well, people right didn't come back but you know what i think it was because of that tragedy that really like bonded Cemented us. yeah, yeah. It, it, you know we all walked all the way back to where her house was where we some of us left our stuff yeah. and all the way back it was very somber mode but um it just like brought us together even 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 more. Yeah, you were sisters at that point. Yeah, it, it literally that night built sisterhood and, and just well, like I mean, long. even your story is so perfect for this film because the film, well, it absolutely, it's all of that stuff that you mm -hmm. describe in the first scene and all those feelings you provoke in that very beginning, but it's also very deep. I mean, biking mm -hmm. in, in LA, women, East LA, Latina yeah. women, women of color, there's a lot wrapped up in this. Mm -hmm. um, where do you want to begin? I mean, maybe begin with some of the statistics around violence mm -hmm. in the lives of right. the women in your community because it's maybe, sadly, not well enough known for people. 
No, yeah. Uh, what is, there's so many. Uh, one out of three women would, uh, will have gone through some type of sexual abuse in their lifetime. Uh, one of three also, what, what, what is it? Like some type of violence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they would have experienced some type of violence. Um, I don't know. You had one out of three leave their home, run away at a certain well, point? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we learn in the film, this is your story. Right. To no small degree. You want yeah. to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I, come, I come from a household, um, yeah, very violent. Um, uh, my parents, you know, they didn't get, they, they, didn't, they didn't have access to parenting classes, right? And so, um, you know, being migrants themselves, they didn't have a lot of um, access, period, you know what I'm saying, to resources. And so I don't fault them to a degree, but at the same time, I feel like it's really important to, to understand like the bigger picture of it. And the bigger picture of it is always white supremacy at the end of the day, you know? And so it, it really kind of like, um, it really affects us, you know, to every, on, on every level, right? Um, from, from the fact that my parents, um, you know, they were, they had these fucked up jobs. I'm sorry, can I, can I say that? Yeah, fucked up jobs. And, um, and so, and then on top of that, you know, I'm dealing with like all types of, um, you know, self-medicating, using drugs, use, using alcohol, and um, yeah, and so our community does that as well, right? But I think that it's really important to understand the 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 legacy of white supremacy and how to, and how it, it it continues to affect us even today, right? And that's this material of the of the film. I mean, in, it, it, there is the joy of the bike riding, but there's also mm -hmm. this serious drumbeat around questions of class and race and right. white supremacy yeah. and immigration sure. Sure. and and violence. Right. Um, I was very struck in the meeting scene that you have in the film, where you talk about your, I guess it's the guidelines for the meetings. It's kind of principles too. There's a line in there where you say oppression exists, but not here. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean to you, Andy? Uh, definitely, it's saying like all the bullshit that we deal with outside of ovarian cycles, we cannot bring it in here because that would be the downfall of like our existence as cycles, as sisters. So mm -hmm. I feel that we really tried to just live by our own rules and sisterhood was definitely just something very strong that, um, I don't know, we felt comfort in each other and finding a... Yeah. You wanna add anything to that, Cheryl? No, yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I feel like uh, with that sentiment of oppression exists but not here, I think that we can have a tendency to reenact that oppression. You know what I'm saying? We do, we can have a tendency to to yeah. be oppressive with each other because right. that's all we've known, right? And so I think it's very important to be intentional in 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 being able to check, to check ourselves. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check ourselves and make sure that we don't. Yeah, and we have like you know a way of handling you know. Um, Issues. Issues like that, you mm -hmm. know, we, um, we, if someone has like some sort of beef with each other, we try to get a mediator and just... Yeah, we and call it the clit rubber. Clit, clit, or clit checker. Or clit, clit checker, yeah. yeah. We changed it from clit checker and we to thought clit, it was to yeah, clit too rubber. Harsh. But yeah, we yeah. sounds good. <laughs> Counterclockwise, yeah. You're also a poet. You want to share a poem? Sure. Um, let me see. It's uh, more of a rap, is that it? Yeah. All right. It's undeniable the power that the masses of our people hold. We're taking this underground like the railroads, breaking the chains of mind control, successfully escaping this society of Satanists, envision this, the final overthrow, reclaiming everything we always had but never knew we owned, off the blood and sweat of broken backs, bought and sold, but now we be the powerful and still the world turns rhythmical. Like the cycles of a season, like a collective conscious shift in reason, bringing an end to what we know on earth as we embrace the birth of dreams deferred, the worth the words that first disturb the yearn to learn the truth that burns as we return to Damn. ancient wisdom. We be like heathens fighting for our freedom from the <laughs> oldest elder to the youngest fetus from the gutters of the ghetto. We were wise like the phoenix reconnected to the double-headed serpent helix. Believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Go Chella. And how does this work intersect with gentrification? How do you mean what? How um, does your work around violence and particularly sexual and racial oh, violence sure. intersect with the question of gentrification of the neighborhood? Well, because it's all it's very violent, you know, like we're getting displaced and that that's also violent. You know what I'm saying? Like when you talk about the fact that we're women on bicycles navigating, right? And we're taking like we're reclaiming our 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 power and our ability to navigate and then and then you bring into it the fact that we're facing gentrification on some like 
you know, like where um, where space and being able to navigate is is being blocked, right? Or um, or we're being displaced or we're being forced out of our community. It's very much related, right? Ovarian psychos. You can get more information at our website, including how to contribute to the group. Or start your yeah. site. Thanks. Thanks.